From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Clinical Reviews, interviews and ideas about innovations in medicine, science, and clinical practice. Welcome to this JAMA Reviews podcast. My name is Anthony Charles. I'm a professor of surgery and I'm the chief of the Division of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In the January 17th edition of JAMA, Dr. Devrick Anderson and his colleagues wrote a, a review on surgical sites infection prevention. Dr. Devrick Anderson is a professor of medicine and an infectious disease specialist at the Duke University School of Medicine, and he's also the director of the Duke Center for Antimicrobial Stewardship and Infection Prevention at Duke University. Dr. Anderson, welcome to this podcast. Thank you, Dr. Charles. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. I read with interest your review, and there were some pertinent issues that you talked about regarding surgical sites infection prevention. Can you please discuss the incidence of surgical site uh, infection, and how do you define surgical site infections? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to. You know, surgical site infection is one of those healthcare-associated infections that, while on any individual basis is low risk, the number of surgical procedures that happen in the U.S. each year ultimately ends up translating into quite a few surgical site infections on an annual basis. And so even if the incidence is 0.6 to 1%, depending on what type of procedure we're talking about, we're still talking about a total of between 300 and 500,000 surgical site infections that happen on a year-to-year basis here in the United States. And so with that type of volume, it certainly becomes a very important issue and an outcome for us to try and prevent as greatly as we can. So, and how would you define a surgical site infection? There are a couple of definitions that are available for us to look at. They have evolved over time and essentially have all evolved to the same place. And that is the CDC currently has a definition they use. And it, the type of surgical site infection we talk about depends on how deeply the infection has occurred. Is We have superficial incisional infections. We have what we call deep incisional infections that are lower than the superficial skin, but still above fascia. And then we have what the CDC calls organ space infections, where there's infection below the fascia. A prime example of one of those might be a prosthetic joint infection after a hip or knee replacement. Given the fact that we have roughly almost a half a million surgical site infections in the United States every year, what is the potential cost implications of having an SSI? Oh, it is, you know, again, you can add the numbers up and it ends up translating to a very large number. There are various estimates that are out there. Some of the more recent ones published out of CDC and groups like Harvard have estimated that the total cost of these surgical site infections can push as high as $10 billion in healthcare costs each year. Right. That is truly impressive. There are several prevention strategies for surgical site infections, and we typically will divide this into the preoperative period the intraoperative period and the postoperative period. Can we just discuss the the preoperative strategies for surgical sites infection prevention and the evidence to support or refute some of these strategies that we're going to talk about? And let's start with hair clipping. Yes, you have exactly laid it out correctly. You know, we think of these as far as the timing of when we might try and address some of the issues and, and decrease risks. And, you know, one of the, I think, key messages from the review that we published is when it comes down to it, there really aren't that many high level evidence based practices that we can invoke. We have many recommendations that we put forward, but when we're looking at the highest level of evidence supported by randomized controlled trials, our interventions that fall in that category are limited. As you mentioned, removal of hair, however, is one where we have multiple randomized controlled trials that have looked at this. And you know, over the course of my career in the last 20 years, it's certainly been something that's evolved from you know, 20 years ago, routinely shaving in the operating room to at this point, essentially saying that if we don't have to, let's not even remove hair. We know that if we use razors, that we cause micro abrasions on the skin, and that translates ultimately to an increased risk of surgical site infection. And again, that's been demonstrated in close to 20 different randomized control trials. Again, ideally, don't remove hair. If you have to use clippers or a depilatory cream, avoid razors. How about the uh, strategy of decolonization? First of all, what is decolonization and what is the evidence? 
an important question. And I would certainly have to say that when we say decolonization, what we are talking about is trying to reduce or eliminate certain types of bacteria. When we think about this from a surgical site infection perspective, what we're thinking about is removing or reducing the amount of staph aureus or staphylococcus aureus that is present on a patient. And obviously, as you know, we all know that comes in two different flavors. There's the methicillin resistant staph aureus MRSA, and then there's the susceptible we call MSSA. We want to reduce both of those, especially in what we call high risk procedures like cardiothoracic procedures or orthopedic procedures that involve hardware. Now, we use that term, but I would have to add the caveat that it's, frankly, it's not entirely clear what the best strategy for decolonization might actually be. Perhaps that's an area for subsequent randomized controlled trials. Nonetheless, when we put together the various types of strategies that have been used, and certainly all of the arrows point towards that being of value, decreasing the risk of surgical site infection specifically related to Staph aureus and maybe even other gram-positive organisms in the end. Certainly. One of the strategies that there's a lot of data on is, of course, prophylactic antibiotics. Can you comment on the timing, the rationale, and whether or not reducing is a viable strategy? Of course. And this is an interesting intervention to think through because this probably is one of the most highly recommended practices that we put forward. And yet there are no randomized control trials that really say this is the absolute you know, high level evidence-based practice we should be. So a lot of our recommendation for this particular one is supported by the physiologic information we know about how antibiotics work. Uh, when we expect the highest level of organism burden to be present. And luckily, there are some data, of course, from cohort studies and other types of studies that do note that this does improve our risks. So prophylaxis is the administration of an antibiotic typically given within an hour of our inc- before the incision to really try and, again, maximize the reduction of bacteria at the surgical site basically at the time of incision is our goal. Now, there are certainly additional issues we have to think through. Many of our antibiotics, we have to adjust because of weight. And so, for example, the the antibiotic we use most commonly for this practice, cefazolin, we would give two grams of cefazolin within 60 minutes prior to incision for most patients. But if that patient is more than 120 kilograms, we would increase that to three grams. And there are other examples of that type of weight-based dosing. And then when we think about the idea of redosing, each one of these antibiotics has a specific half-life that we have to think about. That is to say, we need to keep the gas tank full during the entire procedure if we can. And sometimes that requires an additional dose of antibiotic for our prolonged surgeries, or if there's a surgery that involves a lot of blood loss. Certainly, but shouldn't the choice of prophylactic antibiotic differ based on the type of surgery being performed? You are absolutely right. And we typically use cefazolin because most of our procedures, what we're thinking about is our highest risk would be skin-related organisms. But of course, if we get into the GI tract, if we get into gynecological surgeries, if we get into ENT related or sinus, then we will try and adjust some of our antibiotics because of the different types of organisms we think we might encounter in those specific locations. One of the interesting strategies that you commented on was the idea of surgical safety checklists. And given the checklist fatigue that we all live with (laughs) on a a day-to-day basis, how does a surgical safety checklist reduce SSIs? A really good question. And and we have learned over the years, again, when we think about how best to ensure best practices occur every time we try and go through a process, the use of things like checklists and bundles is another term we'll sometimes think of here as well, all frequently come to the top of the list about strategies to try and again, make sure we're doing the right thing each time we go through this process. It can be a little fatiguing because of how many of these we end up having to deal with, without a doubt. For the issues of surgical safety, probably would elevate it away from infection up to just surgical safety in general. There are surgical checklists that are available. For example, there's been one published by the World Health Organization. It does have components that specifically work through 
risk reduction for infection, but also things like, you know, right surgery, right patient, right time, things like that are part of that checklist as well. And again, there is always going to be some attempt to try and improve our process where we sit right now is with checklists. The more hardwired these types of processes can be, then of course, the more likely we'll get it right each time. Part of the intraoperative strategies that you talked about was one, uh, body temperature regulation. And the other more sort of user-friendly to the surgeon has been the idea of surgical site antisepsis with either povidone iodine or chlorhexidine gluconate plus alcohol. Can you discuss uh, the evidence that shows the superiority of one antisepsis agent to the other and then suddenly comment on on the issue of, of temperature regulation? Of course, each of those are important intraoperative interventions we would recommend for decreasing risk of surgical site infection. When it comes to skin antisepsis, for years, the most data has supported the use of simply alcohol. And when we look to randomized controlled trials, that was all typically where most of the recommendations would fall. But that has evolved over the last four to five years, because obviously, as you well know, there has always been some attempt to also have an antiseptic agent like either povidone iodine or chlorhexidine gluconate as part of that strategy as well. But we struggled with this trying to decide, well, is are they the same? Is one better than the other? And there have been a handful of randomized controlled trials, and they've been considered as part of a meta-analysis, that at this point, point towards chlorhexidine gluconate plus alcohol being superior to povidone iodine plus alcohol. And there are probably some reasonable explanations. For example, povidone iodine actually is inhibited by the presence of blood products. And obviously, we expect some of those to be present when a surgical procedure is performed, whereas that's not the case with chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine typically does last a little longer with its activity than povidone iodine as well. But again, finally, we had some randomized control data evidence that points us towards that conclusion. And regarding prevention of hypothermia intraoperatively? Yes, another interesting area in that Frankly, this particular area has not really evolved much in the last 20 plus years. There were two randomized control trials around the year 2000, maybe a little bit before. And it's important to note here, we're talking about both preoperative warming and intraoperative warming. Essentially, in the big picture, we know that it's more of a continuum, the lower the body temperature than some of our more typical homeostasis processes can go awry. We can have issues with coagulation. We can have issues with the way that our immune system reacts. So we try and avoid hypothermia. This has been done in a handful of different strategies. There are forced air warming devices. There are warming blankets. And there's not necessarily head-to-head data on what typical strategy we should use. We just know we should try and keep the patient warm in some form or fashion. When we do, we do reduce the risk of surgical site infection. Now, part of your post-operative strategy, of course, is this concept of prevention of hyperglycemia, whether or not the patient is diabetic, and the, and the concept of tight glycemic control. Can you comment on that? Because part of the normal physiologic response for surgical patients is to raise the blood sugar, and preventing that perhaps sounds counterintuitive. Very good point to make, and certainly one worth discussing here. And again, like many of these, this is an area that really has evolved over the last, I'd say, five years or so. For a long time, we've known that elevated glucose in the postoperative period is associated with risk of infection. That's true for many types of infection, but we know specifically that that is true for surgical site infection as well. And so over the last 10 to 15 years, there have been various studies that have come out that have allowed us to kind of draw the line in the sand. Well, first it was, let's keep the glucose below 200. And then it was, well, actually we do a little bit better if we keep it below 180. And now most recently, randomized control trials demonstrating that if we can target less than 150, that we seem to have the most optimum reduction in risk of infection. So while that is a normal physiologic response, it, I guess one way to think of it is it, it can get out of control quickly. And it is one that if we're not careful with, because typically, I mean, frankly, 150 still counts as an elevated glucose for uh, normal processes, but we don't want it to go much higher than that, if at all. Now, an interesting part of this conversation as well is, well, why not push even further? And there have been some studies that have tried to look at highly intensive glucose control in the postoperative period, say less than 110, less than 120. 
And while there may actually be some potential benefit when it comes to risk of infection, there's also an increased risk related to hypoglycemic episodes in those types of scenarios. So this may be the Goldilocks principle where it's, you know, not too hot, not too cold, seems to be just right with this 110 to 150 range. And the use of uh, negative pressure wound dressings now has become almost ubiquitous. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, can you just comment on the data and the evidence for its use? Yes, of course. And you are right. This is one of those where you can walk in any operative surgical ward and see many, many patients that have some form of incisional negative pressure wound dressing on. There is reasonable data out of meta-analyses, ultimately of more than 20 randomized control trials, that certainly point towards this as a value when it comes to reducing risk. When you dive deeply into those data, there are probably some patients and some procedures that it is more valuable than others. And so obese patients, patients that have either clean contaminated or even potentially dirty incisions during the procedure probably benefit more than those that either are not obese or have completely clean surgical procedures. Nonetheless, again, when we're looking at those different interventions that are out there with some good high evidence base to support them, this one still falls into that category. Lastly, can we ever get to the point of zero surgical site infections? And what is the role of surgical technique and tissue handling on surgical site infection prevention? I will answer the second part of that first. I think it is very important. One of the things I learned early on in this and working with our colleagues in the surgical suite, the training that I received in infection prevention, is that probably one of the most important things, frankly, is what the surgeon does in the operating room, surgical technique, avoiding dead space, avoiding fluid accumulation as much as possible, handling of the tissues. These are all things that we would highly recommend as important factors. It's a very difficult thing to study and certainly a difficult one when it comes to something like randomized control trials. So it does not fall on the list that we published in our paper, but we do specifically mention it as important. Now, the issue of, you know, can we ever get to zero? This is one of those controversial topics. Uh, you know, you go to an infection prevention meeting and you, these are the types of things we have pro-con debates about, right? <laughs> Some people feel very strongly that we will never get to zero. Some people feel very strongly that we just simply must, and there are ways we can do it. I tend to fall a little bit more on the, I will be surprised if we ever truly get to zero. When we think about how these occur, it's not just the patient, it's not just the organism, it's not just the OR and what happens in there. It's a combination of all of those things. And routinely, as a result, I think that we can absolutely do everything right and still have the combination of factors present that may lead to surgical side infection. Now, again, luckily, very infrequently in the big picture, but I think there must be some kind of floor to this consideration when it comes to how far down we can drive the results. I still think there's still room for improvement from where we are now, but would be very surprised if we ever set zero as a true goal. Thank you, and I'll agree with that. Thank you very, very, <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Anderson, for your time. Congratulations on your publications at JAMA, and thanks for doing this. Thank you, Dr. Charles. It was my pleasure. This episode was produced by Daniel Morrow at the JAMA Network. The audio team listed alphabetically here it includes Mary Lynn Fackerluck, Andrew Foreman, Lisa Harden, Hannah Park, Shirley Stephens, and Dr. Linda Brubaker, Senior Editor of Multimedia. Thanks for listening.